My name is Florian, and today um, I would like to give sort of an introduction on Fable. Fable is being used to compile F# -sharp to JavaScript. We're going to um, ask ourselves what exactly is it? Why should? Uh, what is it relevant in uh, the front-end spectrum? And um, we'll then touch upon some related concepts to finally go over to a demo application, so we get a, a real sense of um, how does this compare to other popular frameworks. So firstly, Fable is a, a compiler that allows you to transpile F-sharp code to JavaScript. It does this with the use of the actual F-sharp compiler service, which is your typical F-sharp compiler. But instead of going to binary, it goes to an intermediate format, which is then picked up by Babel. And Babel is used to compile new ECMAScript um, 6 and beyond features to um, older JavaScript code. So the output is indexed um, ES5 or however you configured your Babel uh, readable JavaScript. It can be used to do functional programming and a lot of more. Um, basically, the key selling point here is that you have a type safe language, which can you can leverage your existing .NET and F -sharp, uh, knowledge because there's compatibility. So you can use things that you know from .NET, for example, system daytime uh, formatting directly in Fable. Um, and it will work exactly as you would expect it to work on .NET. Next to that, there's also the easy JavaScript interrupts. So it's not a black or white story with Fable. You can import functions from existing JavaScript code bases into um, your F# -sharp code and use them accordingly. So hereby, I'd like to say that Fable is a spectrum. You kind of go as much to each side of the spectrum as you want to go. So on one hand, we have the .NET side, the F# -sharp side, functional programming, all the goodness. But on the other hand, we do realize that we compile to JavaScript. So having your existing JavaScript knowledge is um, still very useful. If there are things that you just know how to do in JavaScript or there, um, there are helpful functions or libraries you like to use, you can still do that. You can really go and use um, both sides of the spectrum. So why would you care about Fable? It is a great alternative to both uh, TypeScript and Elm. So as mentioned, it has a it has F Sharp's ex excellent type system, um, which compares to TypeScript has a few little more tricks on its sleeve, and it is less strict than something like Elm. Elm is a purely functional, is a strict functional programming language, which allows you to do the sort of Elm architecture. But Fable goes broader than that. It really can be used everywhere where you can use JavaScript. So not only the browser, think about backend Node.js services, Electron, or um, things like React Native can also be uh, written with Fable. So it really extends the existing JavaScript ecosystem. And if you already like a Sharp, you're definitely going to like Fable. So that's a, that's a major win there. Now we're going to talk about some related concepts because compiling F# -sharp to JavaScript is um, great on its own, but you don't really write your single-page applications using um, pure JavaScript, nor would you do it with pure TypeScript. So you'd kind of pick a framework that has a compatibility in thinking with regarding to the functional programming, and React is a very good choice. So the demo application we're going to build is going to use React and we're going to highlight some things that uh, are written in Fable that just are using the exact um, semantics of React, but just to have everybody on board. In the beginning, Fable can be a bit overwhelming because you have both the JavaScript side, both the .NET side. You use things like React to get it all mixed together. So I'll first explain some concepts and we'll take it from there. Um, I'm currently in the fable.io REPL, which uh, is actually a very genius thing on its own. The fable REPL is actually fable compiler that compiled itself. So fable compiler is written in um, F sharp and the compiler compiled itself. So you end up with a piece of JavaScript that can compile F sharp code and that's being used in the browser here. So if I click this play button, it actually compiles my F# -sharp code on the left side, and if I then look into code, um, I can see what exactly happens. So I do notice I have a bit too much here. For a later example, 
So on line three, we're declaring a uh, record. So a record is kind of like an object, except that when you initialize it, you need to um, declare all the properties in one go. And if you want to update a record, you actually copy the old record and only change the property that is changed. So this has this with keyword. Basically, if you declare a person Tim here, if you want to change his name, you just say, give me this object or, or give me this value and just change one of the properties with the with keyword. You can kind of see if um, this is then being compiled that the older Tim just um, uses the constructor and that's how you are enforced to use immutability because it's, a, it's one of the language features of F-sharp. So we're gonna briefly go over some things in F-sharp and end up with some things in React and then you'll all see it come together in um, the demo application. So don't worry if some things seem strange, uh, we're gonna revisit them anyway. The next uh, great thing about F-sharp is a thing called union types. In a union type, you have a type where you declare it can be one of these three things. So in the case of our shape here, the shape can either be a rectangle or a circle or a triangle. And each uh, leaf of the union type or each uh, union has its own properties. So it's a, it's a really powerful concept. So for example, on this line, I create a rectangle. This rectangle then is a shape. And if I pass a shape to a function, I can't just assume that it's a rectangle. I know it's a shape, but I don't know what exactly it is. So in that case, we have this thing called a pattern match. It's sort of like an if else, but really on steroids. You can really destructure things and have extra when clauses. Um, it's, it's really more verbose uh, way to use uh, than your simple if else constructions. But basically, the shape comes in in this function. And then either it's rectangle or circle or triangle. And whatever it is, we can access its properties and each um, clause of the pattern match should return the same type. So without actually specifying that the size function returns a float, F-sharp was able to, um, to infer that based on the first uh, result of the, um, the first match clause um, here actually. So this is, this is pretty great. This is all type safe, but I didn't really have to type a lot. And yeah, once you learn how to use union types and once you kind of go back to other languages that don't really have this uh, feature, you're really gonna miss them. So I, this has been a terrible eye opener for me. Uh, when I search, first started out in functional programming, it's like, oh my God, union types, why don't we have this in every language? So if we, compile this piece, basically you're, um, this looks pretty readable, but you're not really going to uh, read compiled code as much as uh, similar how that works with other languages that compile to JavaScript. Basically the shape comes in and if a union is created, it has a tag. The nice thing is we never needed to declare a tag. I think TypeScript has a similar feature but in a way that, um, yeah, you need to have your own discriminator based on how will you know which type is a type. And basically this comes out of the box because that's just how a sharp works. Um, then we see that, okay, the match compiles to a switch and et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that a union type on its own doesn't exist in F sharp, you see that we use a lot of things from the Fable library helpers. So next to being a compiler, Fable also provides the necessary things uh, from a library point of view to um, get all the functional programming and .NET compatibility. Next up, one of these uh, types is just rather special. This is the, the option uh, type or the option monad. This is basically saying we have something of a generic T and either it is or it isn't. And this is a very powerful concept to say if um, something you know might be there. So imagine that you, do, you have an integer and you want to do a database call and you want to return a record, but yeah, maybe that record's there, you're not really sure. So in your signature, you can say, okay, uh, for example, this type, it has a property B, but yeah, B might be there or B might not be there. So if we then declare uh, an instance of this, we say, okay, B was sum in this case. Um, let me just comment that. B is sum in this case, and 
basically if you want to know how the deal would be you do a pattern match and either it's some or it's none and it's really a, a nice way of the, being declarative about this however in f sharp there's also the possibility to just go and say give me b.value which is very unsafe and functional programmers would um, you know see this as less for me but Basically, F sharp is not that strict. So when the situation arises that you really need this, or you're at a logical point of view that you know that B is going to be uh, going to have a value, then you can just actually go and call um, B dot value. So that's one of the nice things when you compare it to L. There's no way to get the value out of B unless you do some sort of a pattern matching to uh, get the encapsulated value. Um, next up is the pipe operator. So I have this uh, fictitious function where we start out with a list and then basically going to take some squares, we're going to seal those squares, going to filter them, we're going to select the maximum. So this piece of code just goes from zero to 100, it returns as a list. And then this is being passed in as the last argument of the map function, it maps over the list and does whatever's in here. Then the result of that is going to a filter function, which then gives another list back. So list is an immutable beta type. So if you see list dot something, you can always assume that it's going to be giving you a new list um, as return value. And then we take the max out of this. And then we pass this through to a sort of printing function. With F sharp, it's possible to rewrite this um, to the following. So we had this big nested block. And F sharp has a, a pipe operator. This pipe operator basically lets you pass in an argument um, to the function that is coming. So the last expression before the pipe is being passed as the last argument of the function that follows it. So basically, we have a list here. We have a map function. The map function takes a uh, mapping function as, our, as par as arguments and a list and it returns new lists based on a mapping there so if we say we give this list pipe list.map it ends up as the last argument here we pipe this through to the list.filter it ends up as the last argument here same with the max same with the print function so basically where we had this really nested uh, construction we now have something that really reads from top to bottom, from left to right. So it is very readable in that regard. Um, next, what we're going to use in this example today is called the Elm architecture. And basically what the Elm architecture it uh, kind of does is a sort of circular uh, model to map your state of your application. You have on, on one hand the model, which contains all pieces of, of data. Then the model is being projected on screen, which could be your browser in this case. And then the user um, interacts with a way of messages that it tells um, how the model should be reflected in the future. So basically a message goes to a sort of update function. The update updates the model and gives us a new model, which is then being projected again to the view. And you have this circular motion um, where you really uh, encapsulate your whole application. So from a code point of view, our model in this case is like an integer. And we have two buttons to increase and to decrease them. When we click on these buttons, we dispatch a message. A message gets in, uh, feeded into an update uh, function. The update function gives us the next model. So in this case, model just as an integer, we either add one or subtract one. And the init function returns us the initial model to start with. Then in Elmish, we create a program where the program just binds these three functions together. And if we say with React, we kind of say that uh, on the DOM nodes app, which is created here, we can actually say, OK, um, the view function should return some sort of React element that will be mounted on the app node. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what this does. But uh, the most important thing to, to grasp here is this circular motion. If you click on something and you don't see anything happening on the view, there's also a flow. There's always a flow you can check where should I look for, for an error. I clicked something, did my message get into the update? Did the update give me a correct model? Did the model change and the view just didn't um, comprehend the change in the model? 
So it's really, it's easy to uh, detect these kinds of things. Um, lastly, we're going to have a bit of a React-centric uh, uh, view about this. Elmish doesn't really say how the view function should render it. Today, we're going to use React for the rendering, as React is just a library. What we're here going to do is if we create a function, so in React, it's possible to accept a function that has properties and just return whatever it's in the renders function. If we use this in Fable, uh, we will get an error. So I'm just going to point this out that if we use this, um, again, I have to reload on this. Okay, I'm kind of expecting an error here, um, which kind of goes to the next code. At some times in Fable, we're going to use function component of, and this is just another way of creating your React components, but purely on based on functions. So if you want to use hooks, this um, shouldn't be able to be possible in the function above. And uh, it's apologies. So basically my function here wasn't mounted, so nothing actually happened. If I'm going to do this, then we see we have an, uh, a violation error on the React side. Any function that takes props as an argument can't just use hooks. If we want to make this work in Fable, we need this little helper function called function component of, and then we're able to use hooks inside of um, our Fable application. So this worked and the other thing didn't. For now, we just say go with it, but it's going to be used uh, quite often in the demo application, so I just want to highlight this. And that's about it. This was a brief introduction. Well, let's um, try and puzzle together a uh, demo application. So I've made the Tour of Heroes, which is a popular go-to uh, application when you look at Angular. And there's just enough in this to get really some, uh, some features and some, some feeling with the framework. Basically, we have our top heroes page on the dashboard. We have a list of our heroes. We can add them. We then have an edit page with a detail and a unique URL. We can then remove them again. So your basic uh, standard stuff, but we have some changes in the URLs. We have shared data over pages. And now we're going to see how we um, cope with this from the Fable side of views. So here I have a um, pretty much empty uh, folder. I've installed our JavaScript dependencies. So we need a Fable compiler. We need the Fable loader to work with Webpack. We're going to need Webpack, and we're going to need React um, on the client side. So the first thing we're going to do, like a source directory, we can create a new file called um, app.fsx. fsx is the um, S -sharp scripting extension. So we have a file like this. And we'll also need a webpack config. So webpack.config.js. If I go to this webpack config, have a little snippets to speed things up. Basically, our entry point is the script file. The output will be in the public folder, which doesn't exist yet. Um, I'm calling this the, um, the file name will just be bundle for now. Um, okay, uh, we're going to have a dev server that hosts static files in the public. And here, the most importantly, if Webpack encounters an uh, FS file, be it X or Proch, then it uses the Fable loader, which will then um, trigger the Fable daemon and get things going. So if I now go and say printfn Fable compile this, and I execute yarn webpack uh, minus mode developments, just so it's not uh, minified yet. Webpack isn't filed, so maybe I should do a yarn install.
Okay, apologies for that. Um, if I do now yarn webpack, it is using the Fable compiler. It will uh, fetch the app.fs as entry points, and it should have created a public file somewhere which has our bundle. And if we then go look down below, we can see that our app effects was compiled. And this is some, yeah, this is basically our standard Webpack uh, magic, but our Fable compiled this um, thing was printed here. So it is uh, compiled. Great. So Fable on its own really isn't enough to um, create your applications. You kind of need the, the Rails and Ruby on Rails. You'll need the Elmish in uh, Fable. So we're going to have to add some um, .NET dependencies. To do this, we'll use a different package manager than NuGet. We're going to use Packet. I installed this as a global tool. So if I go and do Packet in it, it creates um, a dependencies file where I can list everything I'll need. Firstly, I'm going to say storage none. This kind of means that, okay, you can download the NuGet packages, but please reuse my cache and don't necessarily download them into my project. This will be handy as Fable only uses the source code just to compile, so it doesn't really need to be close. Um, you're never gonna ship what's coming from uh, NuGet here anyway. So we're going to need Fable fetch, react. Fable.elmish.debug and fable.elmish.browser. If I now do package install, it will resolve the packages. Uh, could not fable elmish debug, sorry, that's debugger. Let's try it again. And the most important thing, a packet that's just been around for a couple of years now, or maybe longer, and it creates a log file. This was something NuGet didn't really have uh, until recent years. So packet really um, makes you focus that every um, version of a dependency is locked, even the children, and it really figures out if all the versions can even work together. So if you ask crazy combinations here, the log file won't be able to create, and that's really what you're trying to solve here. So it's a, it's a way to have less headache. Okay, so these things are now stored. They're already in my cache. If I now go and create a load script with package generate load script, I get a new file, which is placed in my packet and load folder. And this file contains all the references to everything I actually need. So we can use this now in our uh, after that effects, we can just say, okay, load, go one folder up, go packet, load, and uh, let's take the net standard one main. And from there on, we can, for example, open fable.react. Cool. So next thing, we're going to need an index.html file that will be um, to host everything when we run the Webpack Dev server. So in the public folder, I'll create this index.html. Then I have a little thing to fill this up. We're basically gonna create an, uh, a diff with ID app to um, host our React uh, content. We're then gonna load the bundle, this is gonna be served by our um, Webpack dev server. So we can start this immediately. I'm gonna run this little script I prepared here. This is pretty much your basic Webpack stuff. Um, if this is brand new to you, just for a moment go with it. This is kind of how modern frontend works these days. So it is hosting our application at uh, port 8080. If we go there, we don't really see anything yet, except we should see the log statements saying Fable compiled this. So that's good. Cool. 
Next thing, uh, I just want to be sure that our React is uh, set up correctly. So I'm just going to create a little function that returns a React element. And we can use the helper function mount by ID. This is something that's part of um, the Fable core library, which we downloaded from NuGet via the package. And if we compile this, we can see um, the compilation was successfully. So Fable is just running in the background and watching our every move because Webpack is watching all the files. If we now go back to the screen, we can see React compiled this, which, well, isn't really correctly, but you know, you, you get the idea. React works, so that's, uh, that's after we get started. Next, we are going to create a bit of a layout page. So this layout here is going to be uh, what's being reused on every page, and it accepts the function page, which is a React element, and um, this is then being passed as one of the children of the div um, to be uh, rendered. So this is what's being shared across all pages. Now uh, see, I need to open another namespace for the properties. Maybe just to clarify, if we look at these kind of functions, um, we're actually looking at JSX. So if you have JSX, this looks a bit like this. It looks like HTML and a diff, but actually it's a function. But in this case, this is a, a function as well. The diff function takes two arguments, the first being a list, the list of properties. So for example, we could say that the class name is foo. And the second argument is a list of children of the element here. So if we compile this and then use our layout page, we can do this with a pipe operator. So the H1 is being the first argument of the layout function because of the pipe. If we compile this, then we see we have a bit more now, our tour of heroes. And let's just add some styling so it's a bit nicer. Okay, that was my styling. This should work now. Of course not, because we need to update our index.html file. We have to add a link, of course. Let's give this another try. All right, looks a bit better. And now let's create our pages. So for now, maybe let's just create some dummy pages just so we, we have something. Let's create a dashboard page. A heroes page. And a details page. So this just uh, returns a string here. The second argument of the function component of function is uh, what's being uh, visible in the um, in the debug tools. So we'll look at that. And this is whether it should use React Memo or not. Basically, it's only going to re-render if the props of the uh, render function here have been changed. So we'll get back to that in a bit. Now, the next thing we're going to need is uh, our model. So all the state of the entire application should be represented in a model. Um, let's first think about how should the hero type be modeled. For now, let's just say that a hero is a string. We'll see if we, uh, if we manage with this or not. You can always change this later. And each page is going to have its own route. So we kind of have the root URL. So people just uh, access the slash. We then have the dashboard. We have our heroes. And we have a detail page. But the detail page can actually, yeah, it should contain some sort of identifier. So let's say detail of int. Then in our model, we always want to know what route are we on. So we say current route is a route. But we're going to say it's an option. We're not really sure that the current route will match one of these routes. If you decide to go to the slash foo route, um, 
yeah, that's not going to fit into our model. So that's why we're going to say the route is none in that case, because it's um, it's not how we how we intend it to be. And we'll also have our heroes, which will let's create a map. A map is sort of a dictionary function, uh, but it's immutable. So each operation we do with a map in the map module will return a new map, but actually consider it as a dictionary and for now it's going to be fine, I guess. Then there are a couple of things that's going to happen in our application. One of them being a message. So when a user goes to a different page, we'll basically have sort of navigation, uh, navigate message of route. We are going to be able to remove heroes. So I think we're going to need the ID for that. We're going to add heroes where we just need the hero object. And updating heroes will take both the ID and the hero itself. So we kind of know this hero in our map will be need to be updated by a new hero value. Okay, let's go with our init function. Here we declare what our model would look like when we first um, go to the page when it's kind of booting. So heroes for now, let's go with map.empty. We don't really need heroes at the moment. And our current route, well, we just don't know. So let's go with num. The init function needs to return the model, but also a command. And we'll get to commands in a bit. Commands basically generate messages over time. So we'll see the update function has its, uh, has a built-in limitation, which is good. Um, so we can remain into a sort of a pure function kind of mindset. When we create the update function, we get a message and a model. So let's just return the existing model and say there are no commands. Again, don't worry too much about the commands. It will all be, be clear uh, once we fetch our heroes. And lastly, we need some sort of a view function, which gets the model and the dispatch. Dispatch is a way to get new messages into that update function. And basically, we can just return our app. Now we need to wire things together. So I'll open the namespace here. Saying we're going to need elmish.react. We're going to say program that make program, where we pass in init, update, and view. So program really is the glue of our Elmish applications. And then we're going to say program with React fetched. And this is saying, OK, whatever comes out of the view function should be mounted to our app node in our HTML, so in this guy. When with React Batch, I think it means um, that when you you only will be rendering when you request a key uh, frame animation. So basically, it's kind of a, a safety that you don't render more than the browser can handle. So that's what this with uh, React Batch means. Then if we start our program with program that run we'll see that um, nothing really changed. So that's just because we're not really using the information that's in our model. But if I'm going to look at the DevTools uh, here, uh, if I look at my components, I can see that I have an Elmish React Components Lazy View which is a fancy name where you just kind of know that, okay, Elmish really rendered uh, the view which mounted um, to the React nodes uh, based on our um, app identifier that we gave in here. Okay. Um, now, instead of returning this H1, we're going to return the correct page based on the route. So we say model the current route, and this is where this pattern matching thing really shines. We can kind of destructure um, the route value out of the option based on um, depending on what uh, current route is. 
And in this case, we're gonna need the model for that. So the model can be a parameter of uh, our function here. We get the model from the view. So if you pass it down here, it all still works. Now, what I expect is that we would see the 404 page because if we go to our initial uh, model, there you have it. If we go to our initial model, we just say, well, we don't really know it yet. So because it is the current route of none, we end up with a model where the current route is none, which leads us to um, this uh, pattern match clause. Good. So next we're going to try and update the URL that's in the browser. And for that, I'll create a little module here called routing. This is a, yeah, this is just the, the, the way the Elmish um, NuGet package works. Basically we get a window location object and then we'll try to um, parse it to one of these uh, options here. We will say, okay, if it is an empty string, map it to our root objects. If it is dashboard or heroes to dashboard and heroes accordingly. Or if it is a string that starts with detail, has a slash and then any number, any integer, then it's a detail uh, route. So basically this is going from your window location objects and in a functional style, you try all these different combinations and the first one that matches will win and you basically get a route function back. So if you can see in the type signature, we get a route option back because, well, this list is endless. If it doesn't match anything, it will just return uh, none, which is not a coincidence, by the way. Okay, then we need a function when um, the URL updates, we need to reflect the changes. So if we have an URL update function, we sort of have a route that may or may or not have been found. So we'll use an option and we get the current model. For now, let's just say that, okay, we'll update the model with the current route being whatever that was here, whatever that URL update found and we'll say that we didn't have any commands. This, uh, these two pieces are required to um, have our function cope with the history, the browser history uh, location API. So now we can say create a program. I'll need to open another namespace for this. Elmish.navigation. We can say program with sorry, to navigatable, where we can say routing.parsePath and URL update. And now basically when we go to a route, it will go into our um, URL update function, which will auto update the model, which will then reflect in our app here, the model will be changed. So if you go to direct URLs, I would expect that we start seeing things. If I here go to heroes, we cannot get URL heroes, okay? So this is a small mistake we, we have in our Webpack dev uh, server. So basically Webpack doesn't know that it needs to serve the index.html at this point. We can add a property here in our dev server, which is called history, API fallback, we can set this to true. And if you now restart our um, Webpack dev server, it says here every 404 will fall back to the index.html. So once the Fable compiler has compiled everything, I think we can go back to this page. If we reload, it actually gonna uh, go to the 404 page and uh, would expect that it actually found our route. So the current route is still NOLL. Um, let's try the dashboard. Okay, so something still doesn't add up.
Uh, let's be just fairly sure that we're getting into this function. URL updates. Okay, would appear. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So I kind of know what's uh, going on here. We're not getting here in the initial load. That's because we still need to call this function in our init function. So basically, we can have uh, the model and possible command based upon this function, but we need to give it the uh, we need to give the current route to be precise. And we can access this by going to browser.dom.window.location. Um, Sorry, that's documents. Window.location. And that um, is needed to get the current route. So let's just create the route first. If we go to routing uh, parse, we give it the location. Okay, now we have the route. When we have the route, we can uh, return the route and current model. And this actually returns us the exact values that we want to return in the init function. So we can just write it like this. In F sharp, the last uh, line of the function is the return type. So in this case, URL um, update returns a model and a command. And this is exactly what the init needs. So if we save this now, go back, then we have our dashboard. We have our heroes. And we should have our detail page. So, OK, our navigation works. That's great. Now, we're gonna have to do some uh, refactoring here in our layout page to get the navigation working. Basically, um, if we have it on click here, we can add a function. This is an event handler. We can say prevent the default behavior. Don't go to the hash that's listed in the href. But let's go with a message that navigates. In this case, let's go to um, route.dashboard. And we pass this to our dispatch function. So the dispatch function isn't here. So let's add that. And of course, we will need to add a long chain here. It eventually comes from the view function top level. And then we just pass it and pass it and pass it until it gets here and it can be used. So the view function dispatch is an argument of the layout function and compiles. And if we go back to our browser then and go to the dashboards, maybe it's a reload, go to dashboards. Um, yeah. The message was dispatched, but of course our update function needs to uh, reconcile for this. So we can pattern match the incoming message. We can say if it's a navigate command of a route, then we could update the model here, but that wouldn't really reflect the um, URL. So let's go to a navigation that um, new URL. So I'm missing a namespace, I think. New URL. And that takes a string. OK. Navigation new URL, that takes a string. Of course, our route here is a type on its own. So we're basically going to need a function to go from one to the other. So we'll have a to route uh, URL, which takes a route, does a pattern match of all these things, and returns you the string. 
So we can use this in our update function. And we save. We get a warning here because F Sharp expects all the cases of the um, uh, message to be uh, tackled in the update uh, function here. So that's not entirely safe, but for now, it should be okay. I'm just reloading to be very sure. And we have our dashboard page, and this link doesn't do anything because we didn't attach the click handler. So to have the, the click handler uh, work, we're going to do a bit of a, a refactor move because this was pretty excessive. We, we have a view function where we have a dispatch, we pass this to a layout, we pass the layout uh, the dispatch and then gets used into a click handler. So we can do better and we should always try to do better. What I'm going to try here is a um, use the React context um, functionality to capture my model and my display on the top level. And then we can use hooks to um, access the model and the dispatch if we need them. So what we can do here is um, create a sort of a function component that then actually uses these hooks um, to access our dispatch function instead of um, having to, you know, sort it over, uh, pass it through all over the place again. So let's just create some props type. The link is going to have children, so that's gonna be React elements. I'm using sec, so it doesn't really matter if it's a list or an array here. We're having a route where um, the route is the route. And then instead of using units, we're going to say, okay, these are props. And let's create a helper function. So this is a function and it, it's being called with arguments. So we need to call this with our props. So if we go to the children here, we're just passing it through, but it will provide us a nice API um, to consume. The route is route. And we'll need to change this. Basically, we can sort of steal this here and go for it. And where we don't have a dispatch, well, we can just say let dispatch equals use dispatch. So the dispatch function is over here. And the children basically is the last argument here. So this would work. And the route, of course, should be uh, dynamic as well. So this is the route. Props of children, which has a capital here. Okay. And then we sort of can refactor this to our helper function, which is a route to the dashboard. We'll do the same for the heroes. Route to the heroes. But okay, we created the context, but we still need to use this context in our um, app here. So let's create another function called the Elmish Capture. Okay, and in this Elmish Capture, we're gonna wire um, everything from our context together. So the Elmish capture will have a notion of the um, props it needs. These are the app context. Uh, and then it says context provider, app context, give me the props and load the app as its children. So in this case, we won't be able we won't need to use this anymore. Uh, app itself should be a function component. So let's just uh, create this as well. 
and can copy this, get it into here. Go for it now. Okay, we say we don't want to you keep passing through it, but in this case, we still need to use the model. So we can do it like this. And for the dispatch as well, we can say use dispatch. So then our app is called, and each time this use model, this use dispatch is being called. The hook will try and get it from the context, and the context is something that it will try and reach it from its uh, closest parent. So this goes all the way up into our React component of trees, basically gets to the Elmish capture, and over there it's going to be um, it's going to be used. But this is also coming from our view function, so we're okay with this. If I say Elmish capture, I need to provide the props for this. And I think our refactoring in our layout page should be complete by now. So if we now go to heroes and dashboards, this works. And you can see here in our component tree that we have the heroes page, we have our capital A components, which is the one we made it. We have it uh, wrapped in a memo. And this works out very nicely. Okay, another thing we sort of uh, still need to do is if you go to the default page, you actually go to a 404. Uh, or you go to a, a redirecting. We, we have a class for that in our model. So in our view function, we say, okay, if the current route is root, we're gonna redirect you. But at some point we actually should do that. So if we get to our URL update function, we should check what the route is. We can check the route if it is um, some route at root. Then we can just return the model because we're going to navigate to another um, command. We're going to navigate to another route anyway, so we'll pass in this function again. And we can just dispatch a message via commands. And we can say navigate through the route the dashboard. If it is anything else than um, this construct here, it will fall back to the underscore and return this. Basically, the command of message is uh, saying, okay, whenever we have time, dispatch a new message to the feedback loop. And we can't um, control this ourselves, so the navigation does, does need to occur. And when it does occur, it gets to our update function. Our other function will um, go to new URL, which will actually change the browser URL, and at that point, we we can get our navigation. So I think now if we go in the ATU sites, we went straightly to the dashboard page. Um, it's redirected from our route. Okay, good. Now that we have our infrastructure in place, um, let's continue to uh, get the list of our heroes. In our app.fx, we're going to load a um, file from the network. So maybe just to keep things simple, we'll create a JSON file here called heroes. Um, then I have a snippet for some heroes here. And we're going to download this when the page loads. So in the init, we can return some sort of a command. And the command actually is in it and updates are pure functions. In that case of sense that whenever what input comes in, it needs to return the same output. We can't really do asynchronous stuff or um, have some, some side effects as functional programs would call it. So we basically need to create a command. And a command can create a message over time. So when we do things that aren't really that pure, we can create a function that will give us the um, heroes over time. So we create a function that gets a dispatch. It has a function to later create um, heroes or send messages to the update. And basically, 
if we say, okay, we have command here in our init, we say command of subscription, and we do our get heroes. So this is a command here. This already returns a model and and the commands. So it's possible to have create commands from the URL update. So in this case, we'll create a model. We'll sorry, return the model from the URL update, and then say command of batch our initial command to get the heroes and whatever command that comes out of the update URL function. And okay, this does compile, but here we'll actually need to do something. So how do you fetch data in Fable? Well, pretty much as if you would do it in the browser. The modern standard says that you could use the fetch functionality. So Fable has some bindings for this. Um, I'm just going to say, okay, let's fetch the heroes.json. And fetch returns a promise. But we'll need to do some uh, configuration to get the uh, JSON values into a data structure we can work with. What we here have is um, once the model, the fetch function returns a response, it doesn't necessarily return um, anything useful. So we'll get the text, which is the, the raw body of the request, of the response. And we're going to map that until it fits a structure we can work with. Um, in F Sharp, we do kind of have sort of a trust issue thing. So we may create a record here that has an ID and a name, but how do you really know it's the JSON you think you receive? That's kind of a philosophical question that we're going to ask here. And because we don't really know, we're going to decode the JSON. This is a, a functional concept where we're just basically saying, okay, um, Going to open another namespace for this. This is a dependencies dependency, so we're lucky we already have it. I'm going to say, okay, I kind of expect that we're going to have a decode an object, and we'll get to that how it looks. And we're going to pass this to decode.array. So the decoder will contain a function that it knows it should start with an array. So in this case, um, our JSON. Let me put that into. Yeah, so you know that we have an array, so that's how it should work. And we're basically going to say get dot required dot field. We say the JSON should have a required field, and we're going to code this as an int. And we can do the same for the name. So this decoder function will give us a result of string um, and um, the ID. So here we can say the promise will map that. At this point, we, we have our raw text, our JSON. So we'll have our JSON and then we can um, Pattern match the results of the decoding. So let's maybe do it like this. Decode from string. So we have a string. We pass in our decoder and our JSON. That gives us a result. That result can be two things. It can be OK, and it's just the heroes we expect them to be. And we'll use our dispatch function here to get those into the update function or it can have an error. And in this case, the error is a string. Um, I'm just gonna print the print out the string. This will basically tell us where in the JSON something went wrong. So it's, uh, it's pretty neat. Then promises can also fail. So let's write a little catch function that takes the exception of whatever could have gone wrong in the promise. And let's print it out as well. This is not the best practice because if you have something wrong in your error, you kind of want to feed uh, that back into your model. But for now, this is going to be okay. We're now going to say message that heroes loaded. We'll take our heroes and we'll pass that to our dispatch function. 
hero slow that doesn't really exist at the moment. So let's add that as a message. And this takes a, well, let's just make this fairly easy. Let's say it takes an int hero map, which isn't the case. So we'll just have to transform that once more because the heroes here are actually an array. So we can say map of array and feed that to our message. Heroes, okay, and then it gets dispatched. This compiles, and then of course we need to tackle our update function. You can see it in the warnings. So um, heroes loaded, where we can just update the model with the heroes. Okay, and maybe let's just um, hook some debug tools uh, to this, just so that we can uh, see it actually in our debug tools. I'm afraid I'm running a bit out of time. So if we say program with debugger, it compiles, and if we then go back, the dashboard page, first in the network tab, okay, you can see the heroes.json was called, so the response is okay. And if we then go to the Redux um, debug tools, we can see we had a message here called heroes loaded, and we can see that this was the diff in our model. Same way, if we navigate to pages, we can see that we get new messages into this. All right. Um, since I'm thinking kind of running out of time, I'll just stop the demo here and go to the actual solution of this. We'll quickly go through the code and see how the end game uh, worked out. Um, if I just um, let's check out if it's called practice. Um, wonder. Um, I am on this branch and I just don't want any of this anymore. So this was sort of a last result. Uh, I do need to do all the installs again, so apologies for that. But I think we have a fairly good connection here. So the end result was more or less uh, the same. We extend our um, model even further. And sorry, let's pack it restore. Okay, we um, continue putting extra things into the model. So I kind of extracted everything at the end. And the shared logic still is the model. So we have a heroes to current route and we have some messages here. Basically, if you go to our dashboard page, um, we have our top heroes where we just get them from the model and then map them actually to um, links. So if I start this application, let's just go to the package JSON. Um, if you look at this, this is still our, our Elmish program. Something that changed is when we call the dashboard page, this is actually something very neat. We create a lazy element. And to recap my, my quote at the beginning, Fable is a spectrum. 
And this time I really chose to go close to the React metal and use lazy components to dynamically import um, other scripts. So Webpack will only load the dashboard page once it's on the dashboard page. So let me just show you how that looks. We're on the heroes page now. If we look at our network tab, we see that bundle tree was loaded. If we go to dashboard, we can see that other bundles are being loaded. If we then go to a detail page, another bundle again is loaded. So this is really one of those um, cool things that you just reuse the existing ecosystem. I just went and looked this up at the React um, documentation and it's just all there. So you don't really necessarily need to know how to do everything in Fable. If you just fall back to existing JavaScript knowledge, you can really um, go through with the, um, all the fancy stuff. So in order for dynamic imports to work, you need a suspense um, components. So I just imported the suspense from the React module and you need a fallback. If your um, lazy component isn't there yet, you need some sort of a fallback component. And if I put on the um, throttling here, say I have slow, um, maybe not for the first page, if I have a slow connection, then I go to the heroes page. You can see, you can saw it briefly loading our page. So this is um, all just out of the box React functionality, which can really leverage when using Fable and still keep true to the Elmish architecture. So that was kind of the, the climax of the talk. This also, this really works well with script files. Um, you can work with full F -sharp projects as well in Fable, but when you do the dynamic imports, Webpack needs to know that this is its separate file. Then if you go in that optimized station to your um, module exports, you say that each chunk that's async should be splitted, then it will create um, separate bundles when it's being compiled. So maybe to wrap up the demo, I'll just compile um, for production and just see what the uh, output there is. So it's going to drop everything in my public folder. And it's also going to minify. And I think the, the thing I want to highlight here is that bundle size is pretty OK. So in case that's, um, that's a bit of a question. So I hope this is a bit readable, but I'll read it out loud. It's compiling everything. It takes a bit longer because we have the separate bundle thing now, but um, in terms of performance, it's totally worth it. We have an initial bundle of 190 kilobytes and then all the separate pages really just bring what they uh, have on their own. So bundle one is the largest, which means the, the most logic. It's, a, it's the shared um, script file here. This is then basically just React and Fable and everything that's um, you know, part of the ecosystem, not our own code. And then each bundle here um, is just like, yeah, in this example, just a couple of kilobytes, but imagine a, a large application that could really um, reduce um, your startup time because you can really split this up. And that's um, kind of what I was going for here. That was the, for the zone d'etre, the using packets uh, restore file and going for the scripts route. So it's, uh, it's an interesting stake. I'll uh, definitely put this all this code online, so um, don't worry if I went a bit faster from time to time. Apologies for this; it's uh, it's a lot. I do I do realize that. Cool. So that kind of concludes my demo. And lastly, I would like to wrap up with uh, another little message here. This year, we're organizing FableConf um, in Antwerp. It's on the sixth and the seventh September, where the sixth will be filled with work uh, with um, conferences and uh, two tracks of speakers, varying sessions of all um, uh, different kinds of uh, levels. And 7 September, we'll have some workshops, so it's going to be a blast. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Back to you, Matt. All right. Thank you, Florian, for a very interesting presentation. I even enjoyed F-sharp, so that's, uh, that's a good thing, I guess. 
Um, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, one I think you answered. Can we have access later to the source codes? I would say once you put it up, share it with me and we'll put it on the website together with the recording. Mm -hmm. um, then another question I think you kind of answered as well, um, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Is there an advantage in using FSx load scripts instead of an FS proj? Yeah, um, so I'm talking about this actually on, on FableConf. Um, the thing is that here you really start out small. We just had one file compiles to one bundle. And if you would use this in an FS proj, you kind of already have an extra file just for, for being there. So, um, that's one reason, and the optimization uh, with the lazy loading, that's only possible with F sharp files because the Babel um, really needs to know the actual uh, physical path of this, and the import dynamic then says that uh, it should be imported. So if you if you would do this with um, project files, you would need an FS proj for each individual page, and then you would end up with um, four FS brush files matching four FSX files or FS files in that case. So it's, it's kind of a hassle. So um, that's why uh, that's, that's one of the advantages, but it's, uh, it's personal preference at the end of the day. So the, um, I would give it as an advice, start with an FSX and then if it grows and it grows, um, use FS brush. If you're more comfortable with FS brush, just go with FS brush. So it's a, it's a bit of a personal question. All right. Um, is there something like a project template for Fable or should people start creating everything from scratch every time? Um, no, no, definitely not. I just tried to illustrate this, that it's not that bad. But in fact, um, if you go to fable.io, the documentation has been uh, reworked. There are... Um, a lot of uh, start a new project, which has a link to the Fable 2 samples. And there we have many samples, um, which you can start off. You just clone um, this repository and then go to the subfolder, which you find interesting. And the ideal thing is to, to start from there, actually. It will most likely contain a Webpack uh, setup. And based off, you are going to use React, which is going to do something in the browser. If you want to create something on the back end or Node, so that's really your go-to here. There, um, yeah, there currently isn't a, a .NET new experience for Fable, um, so that's why your your best chance is to go to the Fables 2 sample um, repository, which can be found through the documentation. All right, cool. Uh, and then one more. Uh, in almost all of the Fable code I've seen, the function components are not used. Why the heavy focus on them here in this presentation? Um, well, to show that it's a bit of a different um, point of view. So, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to create a presentation that goes beyond what's already out there. So that's why I put a little bit of heavy emphasis on what you can do with React. Um, I didn't really touch upon this, but I also showed some, some examples of React hooks. And in this case, you really need the function components in order to play well with React. So that's why there was a, a bit of an emphasis there. Um, but this is, again, personal opinion and choice. I really enjoy React, and I really enjoy F Sharp. So the fact that I can combine these two worlds is just a bliss to work with for me. All right, thank you. Um, and then one more just came in, and it's good that, uh, that the current page is still on screen. What's the difference between the Fable examples and the safe stack? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, so the safe stack is actually a combination of using both F Sharp and on the front end and the back end. So when you go and use a Fable sample, you'll just get something that runs on Node or in the browser. And when you go for the safe stack, you'll, um, let me bring that URL up. You'll actually have the, the full backend and frontend experience. So the template really, not really sure where it's here. Um, yeah, safe follows us very good documentation, but it really allows you to have that end-to-end -end experience. I think there's also, um, there's some getting started on publishing your actual safe um, to a, a cloud provider. So yeah, safe is just really uh, full stack F sharp and the Fable templates are really just about Fable. 
Okay, thank you. Um, thanks again for a very interesting presentation and we'll quickly switch back to my screen here. All right, there we are. Um, if you want to learn more about Rider, uh, find our websites. Uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter. The recording of this presentation will be available afterwards on JetBrains TV as well as on our blog. And if you have any more questions for Florian, do reach out on Twitter. And if you're really interested in Fable and Elmish and everything you've seen so far, uh, have a look at FableConf uh, next month in Antwerp. With that, thank you for joining, thank you for watching, and Florian, again, thank you for presenting, and you can find more screencasts on JetBrains TV as well. Thanks.